Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for those who are streaming into the room and joining us uh, today for um, this important topic on accounting and finance for your parish. My name is Joe Swimmer. I'm the executive director of Episcopal Parish Network, and um, we are thrilled to have you with us. And of course, thrilled to have Karen and Martha here to share their wisdom um, and years of experience. Um, Episcopal Parish Network is pleased to bring these types of um, programs to you. If you would like to learn more about membership in EPN, please let us know in the chat. You'll find information about our email address. I would also invite you to put your name, um, parish, and city-state that you are writing in from into the chat, along with any questions and comments. Um, without uh, further ado, then, I'm going to hand it off to Karen, and um, thank you all so much for joining us, and thank you to Chaz and Company for helping with this uh, this webinar. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Joe. We're so excited to be here with you all today, and um, we look forward to hopefully what will be a very fruitful session for you all, and uh help you a little bit. So today you have myself and Martha Heels back. Martha um, is a um, CPA and is currently the talent recruitment and development manager for Chazen and Company. However, uh, before that role, she was an account manager with Chazen and has just over 30 some years of accounting experience. So she's the She's the heavy lift accounting pro that will answer a lot of your questions. Um, I am the business development director here at Chazen and Company. And prior to this, I was a director of finance and administration for St. Columbus Episcopal Church in Washington, DC. So I'll speak to you more about um, processes and suggestions that I might have based on my work experience. And then Martha will really dig deep into the accounting. So. Martha, if you want to start, we can um, put up our slides and we'll just go ahead and dig right in. So today we're talking about um, reporting for, you know, in order for the governance, for your vestries to be really um, focused more on strategic uh, discussions and also to talk about cash flow management, um, completely understanding that in the church world, uh, we don't tend to see money until the end of the year and beginning of the new year. And so we have to learn how to manage that um, successfully. Uh, just a note on our PowerPoint slides, you will find some that are a little wordy and very detailed. And we did that on purpose because we will be sharing this PowerPoint um, slide deck with you all. And um, we felt it would be important for you to have the details also that go along with it. So um, you will be getting the, the slides and also you will receive a link to watch the video again if you want to. So that should answer. I saw a couple questions come in about that. So like I mentioned, today we're going to focus on reports, uh, keeping your reports at different levels of detail in order to produce the information that is required for the different groups that are managing the, um, you know, the finances of the parish. We're also going to talk about budgeting and what budgeting can look like based on the fact that you have to manage cash and your cash flow to be effective throughout the year. So let's see what that next slide we've got. So the goals. Within a parish, you want to make sure that you have a healthy parish, which means that you can deliver programs and offer what you need to meet the needs of your parishioners and the mission of your particular parish. You also need to make sure that you have controlled, proper internal controls in place for the assets that you are, you've been, you know, have been placed responsible for, and also to make sure that you're being, um, that you're honoring the gifts made by your donors. You also need to make sure that your reports, your data, that you have access to that information, it's accurate, and that you can produce whatever you need to for donors, leadership, and other parishioners. So the huge thing really when you're dealing with vestry or finance committee is to make sure that they're focusing on the right things. So you want to make sure you're not presenting reports that tell them that you bought 15 pencils at a price of X in a month. They need to just know the overall cost of what, what 
what is being spent on administration to run the parish. So what you're going to find out as we go through this is we're going to show you some sample reports and um, talk to you in detail about what you should be thinking about as you're presenting financial reports to different members of your parish, depending on the different uh, boards or leadership roles that they fill. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Martha. All right, so the accountant has arrived and got a bunch of numbers and a big messy screen, but I just wanted to uh, point out a few things about what we typically will see as uh, church financials. Um, we have a lot of churches as clients, and this is a very typical report. So, and this happens to be the income or the revenue section of the report. So you can see there's a lot of lines. There's a lot of numbers. The numbers are very detailed. You've even got uh, 29 cents in pledge payments from the previous year. So you can see that there's just a whole lot of numbers on this page. And when you sit down with your vestry or your finance committee, where, where do you really want their eyes to go on this report? Do you want their eyes to be on every one of those numbers or is there something you could do to make it a little more effective? I've made some suggestions in this particular example of some lines that might be combined. And I, I, I counted it up. And if you made the combinations that I'm suggesting, you would go from um, 14, 13 lines to seven lines. So that's, that's uh, six less places for people's eyes to go hunting. We're not gonna talk at all about the column structure here, but I really just wanted to focus on how much you really expect people to take in and whether you really need the help of your finance committee, your vestry, whoever you're meeting with to look at those things, okay? So just consider just consider the audience and to think about um, where you'd like them to focus. Here's sort of the other half of the financial report, an excerpt of that. Again, you've got a lot of lines here together. You've got the auto allowance for the rector, the auto allowance for the associate rector, cell phone reimbursement. And those are, those are all things that someone has to manage. I'm not suggesting that you don't account for those things. What I am suggesting is that your leadership probably does not need to see that level of detail in order to help you um, manage the, you know, the mission and, and manage the resources that you have as a parish. Um, and sometimes you'll get into discussions like somebody will ask a question. Well, when did we decide to start reimbursing some, somebody for their cell phone? which, you know, may be a good question, but that's, you know, it takes a lot of time and it probably isn't the way you want to spend your vestry or finance committee meeting going into that. So again, if you, if you don't show all the detail, you don't get those kinds of questions. Not that they're not good questions, it's just who, who should be asking those questions. Well, Marissa, someone, sorry, just to tell you quickly, somebody brought up a, a cool point that they said that when they present these reports, they put them in yellow, green and red to throw like red, you're over budget, green, you're within budget and yellow, like, ooh, look out, you might be coming a little over. So that's kind of a cool idea too, just to add some more. And then, again, so I presume in a setting like that, that green is good, you don't have to really spend time on it, red's where you really wanna focus. Um, so that, that, that's, a good, that's a good way to just cut down on some of the lines too. Um, all right, so let's, let's take another example. So this is a sample report that you might consider using. Um, and this is an actual versus budget, um, which is the same kind of report we just looked at. But here you're going up to a really pretty high summary level. So I would not suggest a report like this to go to a finance committee. It's a little bit too high level. But there's a lot of um, audiences within a parish that, um, you know, a report like this is exactly what they need. Um, it's very easy to read. Um, and for people who don't read pictures very well, there's, you know, there's some numbers at the bottom to help the people who want numbers to go with their pictures. But basically what you see here at a very quick glance is, um, you know, depending on exactly where we are in the year, and I would suggest you put that on your picture, um, your, everything seems to be within budget except for your plant. So here, when you're talking about your financials with who, with your group, that's where you would focus. Like what's going on with the plant? You know, where, wh what caused us to go over? Was the budget bad? You know, did something happen, um, you know, that people are not already aware of? So there you're focusing people in 
on something that you know probably needs some discussion and that where there might be some concern. Can I um, jump in really quickly, Martha? There's a couple questions. One it is pertains to the the slide before this one, which it says, "Are you suggesting collapsing the lines on the chart of accounts or just on individualized reports?" Um, not within the chart of accounts. So I think you need to account for all these things within the chart of accounts. But when you report, I suggest that you collapse the lines and use a header. So in this case, um, these are the pension is kind of unrelated to the auto. This, but you could have a line that said something like pastoral support costs or something like that, um, or ministry support, something like that. Um, just, just to take all those little lines, some of them that don't even have a budget on them. You know, you got lines here that don't even have any numbers on them. So that's 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 a num. You know, you don't want that. Um, so yes, I'm just suggesting that for reporting, you collapse those lines. Um, there's a question about you know some softwares are limited with reporting capabilities. And granted, you can export to Excel and tweak it, combine, put in colors, all that. But when you've got volunteer bookkeepers and treasurers, that's a lot of work on them. So, you know, what's a recommendation for someone who's in that situation? So the recommendation in that case would be to definitely work on your chart of accounts so that your chart of accounts and, and almost all bookkeeping and accounting softwares have the ability to collapse as long as you have a header account. So if you had a personnel, for example, a personnel header account, and then underneath that you had wages, fringe, all kinds of different things. So that's that's a definitely a reason to look at your chart of accounts and think about where you might build in some header lines so that your software will do the work for you. And I absolutely agree. I, I hate manual manipulation of reports, and it's really hard to get something done quickly when you're going to have to sit and cut and paste and check your formulas and all that. So I, I would really push into your chart of accounts for those headers. Um, and you know we can talk a little bit more about that if we have time later, but that's in almost all softwares, you can add those, and that's why they're available. Okay, so this is this is one example, um, and this is uh, this is also typically um, when you talk with your um, boards and committees, you want to think about um, the issue, the you know the big issues financially in the church. So obviously, um, spending, staying within budget is a huge issue. Hence, this report that I recommended here that I'm sending here as an example. Another thing that you know we're going to talk about more later, but it's a huge. Um, topic is, you know, what, how much cash um, does the parish have? And um, where, you know, where do I know that I'm going to have to maybe think about, you know, how I'm going to make my payroll that particular month? As you know, giving tends to be seasonal, um, probably better than it used to be, but it's, it's still a problem. So again, the report does not you know, there's not, this is a busy report because it has a long period of time on it and, you know, three years and three different lines, but it also helps you look at how are we doing this year compared to what's happened in the past? And if it's not the same, why not? And what kind of help do we need from the leadership of a church to really, you know, get on these cash issues? So I've got some, you know, examples of what I would consider to be sort of more impactful kinds of questions and conversations that would happen if you had reports that were a little bit closer to the last two I've showed you than those first two that I showed you with all the lines on them. So, you know, why, why do we have higher plant costs? Um, can we do anything to address these low cash months? Like, what are we going to do in July? Are we going to have enough cash to make the payroll? If we're not, how are we going to do that? How do we plan for that in the future? Those kinds of things. So, Again, you don't have the details here, but you have indicators, and the indicators are good for conversation. So. Martha, I have a question. Our vestry meets monthly for about an hour and a half to two hours. How much time should I, as a treasurer, be spending on presenting the monthly financial statements? Well, it, you know, I mean, I can, I, was to say, I can speak by from experience. I came from a pretty large and complex um, parish and our treasurer spent probably about 15 minutes and left five minutes for questions. Um, that way, that's that's 
when he came to the meeting, he was pretty um, efficient on showing, you know, these are the, the areas that we have variances. These are the reasons why, you know, this is where we see we might be spending over budget. These are the reasons why, you know, do you all have any questions? And then kind of taking it from there. We did present reports like the ones that she just, that Martha just showed you with the graphs and the charts for vestry. So it gave them a quick snippet and then we would do a summary um, to, and provide that prior to the meeting so they would have that ahead of time so that they were prepared with any questions and then we can dig deeper if we have to. I think also another thing is, is if your vestry financials ultimately get published, you know, to the entire parish, and I know sometimes the vestry financials will, um, that's, I'm not, no one's hiding anything and there's a lot of data that goes behind these reports, but there's, there's a lot of people that would like to help manage um, and in all kinds of organizations. And the more data you give them, the more they're interested in getting involved in management. So it's just kind of a word of caution that the more you publish, the more questions are gonna come up on, on very detailed line items. So, and I know no one has enough time to answer all those emails. So just, just a additional thought. Okay. Okay, um, so again, just 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 a few reminders. Um, the audience drives your report. So your volunteer leadership, um, they're going to be looking at very different reports than your hired, you know, director of finance or your, um, you know, any of your budget managers, um, your staff that, you know, the, your programming staff, your ministry staff. They're going to be looking at details. But your volunteer leadership generally providing financial oversight. So you want to bring it up a little bit to some more of the oversight level as opposed to line item management. Um, and also the third point here I want to I want to mention, because this was a big thing with Karen and her parish, is to provide narratives to the committee that they can review hopefully in advance. I mean, make your financials available so people have some time. So they're not reading everything while you're all gathered together. That'll help a lot on the amount of time you need to spend on your financials. But if you provide narratives that hit those high points, like the, remember we had plant costs that were over budget. You can you can call out you know what's going on. You know the the elevator broke down and it was above. You know we had to pay a deductible or something on our our um, maintenance policy or something like that. You can you can pull those things out and especially if you've got numbers that are high just related to a timing difference, things happened earlier or later than you thought in your budget, those can very quickly be ticked off and no one has to ask about them. So it really does, um, providing a narrative, it's it's more investment up front, but you'll spend a lot less time talking through the details. Um, and again, just a reminder, just leverage your financials so that you can you can stick to the more strategic issues. I think um, one of the things we heard when we've talked to some people um, kind of in the church and religious school world is that during COVID and costs, everybody was really concerned about costs and people got involved at a much deeper level than they ever had been in the past. And once that happens, how do you pull them back out? And you know, you don't need their help day to day managing line items. So that's another thing. It's I would never suggest that you change the reports one month and say, here's your new reports, but start to kind of gradually pull back a little bit from the details. And also communicate why, you know, and explain why. Um, someone did ask, you know, and I think we answered it, um, the question was sent beforehand, but I just want to make sure uh, they asked, you know, should the reports look different for the finance committee versus vestry? And the answer, I think, in summary to what Martha was saying is, yes, your finance committee will get more line item detail where the vestry will get the collapsed um, titles, like we said, personnel, the total cost, you know, continuing education, et cetera, ministry, you know, youth, total cost, th things like that versus all the detail. I think you also need to be cognizant in smaller parishes of, you know, what, you know, where, where do you cross the line between privacy and, you know, especially when you're talking about personnel costs, is that all open to everyone or is that something that you need to structure your report so that they don't obviously give details of any particular person? Um, you definitely don't wanna do that, particularly not something you're gonna publish on your website or something like that. 
Um, so here's just some, some comments about what we would recommend as the best practices in terms of who gets what data when. Um, you know, the ministry leadership should be getting reports all the time. It may be more often than once a month. It may be any point, you know, during a, you know, they're in the middle of a big project and, you know, they're trying to make the money go last. You, you may be giving them weekly reports. Just have to make sure that all your costs are recorded as often as they need their reports. But that's, you know, that's kind of an ongoing need that needs to be addressed. But your finance committee, I would say monthly, at, you know, that's that's kind of the perfect, even if you do, even if your finance committee doesn't meet monthly, I would still provide them financial information monthly, because those are the people who are charged with managing kind of the day-to-day -day finances, so um, beyond the staff. Um, and then the best street, it it's generally follows a meeting schedule. Um, it you know, there's different cultures and different parishes, but I would say no less than quarterly on vestry financials. And it could be more often if that's, if your vestry meets every month. Um, parish members, again, there are cultural things around this, but, you know, kind of uh, limited, I would say, or, or as requested, just because, you know, there's lots and lots of people looking at the numbers. And if you wanna add your whole parish to that, you know, well, go for it. But I would suggest that you really don't need to do that. But there isn't, like I said, that that information is available upon request. And that would typically be what I would say is the best practice. Someone had asked, um, their, their treasurer uh, leads a finance committee meeting. He develops the profit and loss statement off of QuickBooks, provides um, a letter with a general overview or excuse me, overview of activity, revenue versus, um, you know, uh, expenses and Yes, that's fine. And then he de he delivers the general trends to the vestry, which is, that's a good process to answer your question. Sorry, Martha, go ahead next. Yeah, no, I think that's, I mean, I think that's great. And it brings up a point we'll talk about a little bit later, but when we, when we are in a relationship, you know, with, with a parish, it's all kinds of different ways that the numbers come together. Right. And it really, um, and that's really what, you know, we really, you know, if you've got a volunteer that can do that and does it, that's fabulous. If you don't, you know, you got to give them some help. But there's all kinds of different ways. And really, you know, anything is acceptable as long as the numbers are accurate and people get good information. So, Okay. So um, reports are great at telling you what has happened in the past. So how are you going to pay your bills in the future? So <laughs> let's let's talk about that. So the key really to make sure that you are focused on what is coming down the road and um, meet the needs of the parish and the mission that has been set forth is to have a budget. So the key there is to figure out, you know, what what is the pledge campaign going to look like? What 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 are we all estimating we're going to get in? So we start there, and then you have to begin to go through different processes. And so you can either say, for example, um, when I joined St. Columbus Episcopal Church, there had been a rector change. He had been there for just over a year. And there was conversation about, are we spending the money the way that we should? Are the programs the way that we are, you know, the programs that we're doing, the ones that we wanna do, et cetera. And so we did actually what's called a zero-based budget, which means we start with zero. Instead of saying, you know, for example, to the children's minister, well, annually you do these three events and then you do a fundraiser that's done this way and et cetera, et cetera. And so let's just plug those in to start and then let's go from there. You actually will start at ground zero and say, okay, let's pretend we've never done this before. What do you want to do that you think is successful that's going to move the needle in the right direction for children's ministry? Let's write those all down. Let's figure out what it's going to cost to do it. And then let's talk about how we're going to get the money to do it. So whether it's going to be pledge funds, it, we, we're going to have enough money, you know, at the end of this whole budget process and it's going to work out and you're going to get to do what you need to do and it all makes sense and it's great. Or are we going to have to have an additional fundraiser? So I actually had two meetings with the director, started with what do we need to do? What's your wish list? What do you think is going to work? Put in all those expenses. Then I would run the budget based on what we anticipated our pledge campaign would be would bring in. And then I went back and said, okay, you're short X dollars. How are we going to make up the shortfall? Or is there anything you want to remove? 
So that's kind of how the, the zero based budget works. Another idea is to just, like I said earlier, take what you've spent maybe the last three years or two years and build a tentative budget off of that and then go to the director or the, the, the pastor and say, okay, so here's the, here's what we've, this is what I've tentatively put on for your budget. Let's talk about this. Is this what you want to do and how you want to do it? And is this what it's going to cost? So that's kind of two different um, ways to attack the budget. You also need to understand, and those sitting around the table that are approving budget need to understand that budgets can be adjusted. So after the first quarter, you look back, you see what you've spent, what you haven't. There might be changes or tweaks that need to be made and revised budgets can be approved. So just keep that in mind as well. People like to think this is a budget and it's stuck in stone. Well, someone may have budgeted $5,000 for some event and they're not gonna do it anymore. So now there's $5,000 money freed up. And so someone else is gonna use it for something else. So just be open to changes as they arise throughout the year. Go ahead. Um, I think I kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, so for the budget process initially, um, you know, staff, rector need to figure out how much money do we think we're going to get from the pledge campaign? What other sources of revenue do we have? Are you renting space out? You know, are you having events that cause people to come onto your, <laughs> excuse me, your property? Are they paying for anything, et cetera? What needs to be in it? How detailed do you need to be? Um, that's all going to depend on the different, I, I personally think, ministry areas. Um, where do you budget? So I used to budget on spreadsheets and then eventually went to a budget software that I found was a lot easier to do. So that's something that you want to be thinking about. Like, are there tools that can help me that will actually save us money because now you in this role can be doing something else other than dealing with a spreadsheet. Um, and then when is budgeting done? I used to start out three to four months before it was due and then have it approved. The final, I would have one rough draft approval by finance committee two months before it was due. And then the final, you know, one month before it was due and then to vestry for them to do it. Um, sorry, I've got all these questions popping up. So oh, from you're, also, you're <laughs> no, that's okay. I'll answer them in a second. I'll just finish through this. So just realize that all costs may not be fully de determinable. Like a key for that was COVID. <laughs> I don't know if you all found COVID budgeting was a challenge for me. I'm sure you found it that way too, because we didn't realize we weren't ever going to open for probably that whole first year, but you know, you can, um, You've got to figure out what's what's happening that's going on that that might change what your budget is going to look like. Um, when you think about budgeting, best guess is probably going to be the right approach for many line items. Most of you, if not, if you're somewhat new to your parish, then you, some of your parish staff will be familiar with the items that are in the budget and about estimate of what they cost. So I think. I think that's good. Um, again, with the spreadsheets, if you find that you're spending too much time fixing formulas, et cetera, did you leave a whole employee off the, the employee personnel budget when you did it? Things like that, because that has happened to me. So I can talk from experience. So, you know, the budgeting tool can sometimes be better. So let's see. Um, there's a lot of questions about budgeting software, and I'm not sure that the one that I used is the one that we recommend nowadays, Martha. I don't know. Do you know anything about the budgeting software? Well, the, the primary budgeting software that um, we've worked with with churches is called is is, is Mardis, um, and Mardis is integrated with a couple like three or four different accounting softwares, but it, but it's not, it does not integrate with ACS, for example, or Shelby or some of the common church products. Right. So um, if you're interested, we can, you know, we can talk about your circumstances and help you with some recommendations on that. Um, but the, but the, the big thing is, is the nice thing about a tool like Martis is it, it's constantly, you can budget and then you can start to forecast, which we're kind of talking about in the cash sense of the word here. 
um, and it can pull your actuals in and you can you can do all of that comparative reporting and all of that. But again, um, you know, if you're not, if you if you can't have those kind of tools, it's understandable, but just remember that, you know, it's, that staff resources are, you know, very uh, in short demand in all search contexts. And so if your staff is buried in spreadsheets instead of doing programs, you know, that that's when you start to think about does the, you know, does a software tool really cost um, too much? Um, because if you're burning out your staff or hire, having to hire staff to do spreadsheets or something, then you're starting to trade those costs off. So. Um, there was one thing. Oh, this is a good question. Any suggestions for a good way to effectively and kindly deal with ministry leaders who typically go over budget and or have no financial sense? Um, what I used to do is I used to print them basically, you know, a, a, I'll call it from for from a for-profit standpoint that you you all might be using this term as a profit and loss statement or the statement of financial activity for them and just kind of say so just so you know you're over budget in these things so if you're going to have any uh, uh, if you're going to incur additional expenses this year I need you to ask me before you can just go spending the money for your ministry area and that usually reins them in but um, I would suggest having, you know, maybe meeting with them monthly or sending them the report monthly just for their budget area and just say, just so you know, you only have $200 left for the remainder of the year. Let me know if you think you're going to go over so we can talk about other things because I'm going to have to take money from other ministry areas to offset yours. So it's like they start to like, aha, uh -huh. maybe not be so harsh the first year, but like the second year, just say, look, I told you last year, this is how much money you have and you've got to stay within that. So I know that's a hard one. There's one here about how um, involved should clergy be. I think um, if you're talking about the rector level, they should be involved because they are, you know, held accountable to the vestry. If you're talking about um, associate rectors and their different areas, again, I think that all ministry directors, leaders, clergy, et cetera, should be responsible for their area of the budget. And I would hold them accountable and share with them, um, you know, what their budgets are and what's going on. So. One thing, one thing I might suggest because we we do this a lot with um, clients that you know they're they struggle with numbers themselves. That's that's why they've reached out for help. Is to use a you know an interview uh, format for budgeting. So you're not saying to them how much are you going to spend. You're saying what are you going to do? How many people are going to be involved? You know what's what's your sort of dream? What's your reality? Whatever. Use an interview format and then you take that interview away if you're the financial person and you start to put some numbers on it and you've never really asked them for one number except participation which I think most clergy um you know are you know they're very that's something they're thinking about how you know who's going to be involved are you going to need a guest speaker those kinds of things um so so keep the questions programming related but then take them and translate them into cost um and that's that's a good approach with people who are just like oh god i hate budget i hate numbers i don't understand them um and that's another thing you can sort of pull that out it's also interesting to pull that, that kind of information out when you're preparing narratives to maybe present a budget um to you know to your perish at the time, you can pull some of those narrative things out from those interviews and they actually can become the basis of a, a narrative description of the budget, which is something that's nice to have too sometimes. So, um, you know, don't, it's, try not to fight against what, what you can't win and just, just try to, you know, sneak in there and get the information you need, so. I'm going to give you this one, Martha. Okay. Give me the slide. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. We, um, you know, the part of the reason we talked about a budget is because you have to have a budget to do a cash forecast, at least in in my humble opinion, in our humble opinions, I should say, because a, a budget is is you've really drawn the picture of your programming and your parish year and. There's a lot of other information that goes into a cash forecast, but that's a good place to start. How much are we going to bring in and how much is going to go out? And then to take that information. And usually the first year you have a budget, you'll have, you know, one column of numbers. You won't have 12 columns or you won't have four columns for quarters. You'll just have one number that says this is going to be how much we're going to bring in from pledges. 
building, rent, these different things. And this is what's going to go out for these things. But if you're if you're having trouble managing your cash, then you have to start to uh, to use a term that's not really a word, but we use it all the time. You have to start to calendarize those numbers. Um, and I would suggest that as you budget, because budget versus actual reports are so frustrating to explain if your budget is one twelfth of the annual budget as opposed to what you think is going to be spent in any given month. First year, you can't do it. You don't have the data usually, but that's where you're that's where you're trying to get towards is you're trying to get towards spreading your expenses across the year close to how they um, occur. Um, but there's all kinds of um, let's see, I'll just make sure I didn't miss anything there. All right, so you have to take your budget and you have to translate it to a cash basis if you can. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, if you've not heard the term gap, I wrote it out here for you, but a lot of people use that word. But gap financial statements um, are not particularly useful when you're trying to look at cash because uh, the whole theory behind gap is if you know you've got a cost, you record it. Not that you've paid for it, you know you have a cost. If you know you're going to have money coming in, like pledge money coming in, you record it as revenue. And this is, you know, there's a lot of parishes that do their accounting on a cash basis because that's so hard for people to wrap their heads around. But if you have if you have gap financials, then you need you've got some work to do. So then you're talking about okay, when do, when are the cash events? Like Karen said early on, you know you get most of your money in the last quarter of the year cash coming in. Um, so all right, and when does most of your money go out? Well, it probably goes out you know when the programming year starts. So maybe February through June or something like that. So, so they don't match. And, you know, you're trying to make, you're trying to figure out how to make the cash last through the programming year. So you want, you want to be able to figure out the timing of the cash outlays. Um, and it's hard to do, um, but if you have, if you have some accounting records from the past, you're, again, you're not looking at your gap accounting records, you're looking at your cash flow and you're looking at your how you paid your bills and then how you deposited cash. Those are the things that you're going to look at to kind of transfer all this budget stuff into this is what we think is going to come in and this is when and this one go out and when it's going to go out. Um, you'll, you'll probably know a lot more about your about the flow of pledge pledge and non-pledge funds in, then you'll know about your expenses going out. I think most parishes keep pretty close track of pledge payments and how they happen. So that that's a lot of times the easier part of this exercise. But the other thing to think about is when you're trying to figure out if you have enough cash or if you're going to have enough cash, think about future commitments that you can't get out of, but you're going to have to, you know, that, that are going to be cash events. So you have, you really have to look forward. Like, the little puppy who was looking sideways. That won't work. So you got to look forward. Um, so once you kind of have the timing and the amounts, then you're pretty close to having a solid cash forecast. So not so hard. Well, yeah, easy for me to say, but it, be it begins to be a tool that just sort of feeds itself. So the cash forecasting tool gets to be a lot better over time when you realize how important it is to really try to you know, to keep those kind of records. And you're, go you're going to identify surplus periods, hopefully, um, and, you know, those end of the year periods. And so then, you know, that your, your cash forecast is going to sit alongside your investment strategy. So you make sure that you have that cash when you need it later in the year. Um, and then how are we going to address, address deficits? Well, we're going to use some of our investments or some of our, um, you know, cash that we've saved back. Um, those are always interesting times to look and see if you have any restricted funds that can be used within the rules. Um, designated funds also. Um, or are you really going to have to go out and do fundraising? And if you are going to have to do fundraising for operating expenses, how are you going to do that? In most cases, you don't want to do some every month. You don't want to go to somebody at the end of every month and say, hey, the payroll's coming up. Hey, the payroll's coming up. You know, can you help me again this month? Can you help me again this month? 
So plan, you know, having an idea when those deficits are going to happen and whether or not they can be funded. And if they can't, can we can we go out with one appeal um, for additional operating cash? Um, or can we consider using a letter of credit from the bank? Um, that's another option sometimes. Um, it's, this is the this is a terrible problem, but it's a common problem. Um, so it's just it's better to know when it's coming in advance than to stick your head in the sand. So it's one, this is one last note, and this will be better noted when you read these slides, is if you have restricted cash, so you're doing, you're in the middle of a capital campaign and people have already started to pay on their capital pledges, that's restricted cash. You don't have to go open a separate bank account and put that cash in there so you don't spend it. You just need to, you just need to account for that cash so that when you look at your cash balance, you can always say, yes, I have $100,000, but 10,000 of that is restricted cash. You know, there, in, in most organizations, there are little infringements on restricted cash, but it's not a good long-term strategy because you ultimately, you know, you, you were told by your donor what that could be spent on. And if you use it for your payroll and you don't have it to, for your capital when it comes time to spend it, then, you've, then you're in a, a legal bind that you don't want to be in. So you really just, like I said, don't open a bunch of different accounts. That's not necessary, but make sure that you're tracking what's restricted. So. Um, couple things. One mm -hmm. is uh, someone said that they used to budget pledge income over percentage based on last five years, average month by month, average giving. And I think that's a great tool. Um, I worked for a large Methodist church and we did the same thing. Uh, at St. Columbus, our records weren't so wonderful going back in time. So what I did is I just built uh, an Excel spreadsheet that would say in January of the first year I was there, this is how much we got, February, et cetera, and then built it the next year. So then we had started to have a pattern and an idea of how much money we got for each month of the year so that we could then plan expenses accordingly. Um Someone puts, I'm so perplexed that our church has budgeted in the red for so many years. Shouldn't we look to cut expensive and see, expenses and seek additional revenue? That's when you really want to try to have some of those, I think, more strategic conversations and um, try to get your vestry involved in that. And, you know, how can we grow revenue? You know, are there pieces of the property that aren't being used that we can you know, rent out his office space during the week? Is there a group that we know, an outside group that we want to have, um, you know, like we had the uh, orchestra use our huge parish hall for, for practice and that generated revenue. Like, are there groups out there that you can charge? Because um, I know sometimes we let nonprofits come in and we don't charge them because we find it that, you know, it's our ministry and it's our mission to help those. But are there groups out there that can afford it and will pay to use some of your space? Um, you know, also long-term strategic planning for your property. Is there something you can build on your property that can generate revenue? You know, different things like that you should be looking at for long-term. And then short-term, you know, are there some cuts that you can make? Just make sure that you're being strategic and doing that. And don't, let's say, cut off, you know, terminate three staff people that you're going to need in a year once you grow in a certain direction, you know, so just be very strategic when you're looking at what money to bring in and what money to reduce. Um, there is a question here on what is your take on interfund loans? Should there be a vestry approved process or policy? I'm sorry, not process. So I, I take it that interfund loans means borrowing from a restricted fund. Right. Um, I, I don't know that I can tell you what my take on I mean, I, well, I can speak to this and just say we had a threshold. The yeah. finance office could do X dollars without request and then excess of that they needed to get approval. But we had to have a plan to replenish the funds. We couldn't just borrow. Um, how is a good way to encourage your church givers to give year round as opposed to a lot of their pledge income and free giving at the end of the year? I say online giving is the way to do it and just do an ask them to sign up for auto draft, you know, $1,200 gift a year is hundred dollars a month. Do it like that and try to encourage them to do online giving with auto draft. I know that you incur fees from credit card costs for doing that. Um, I, I'm not sure if this is the case anymore because I've been out of it for a couple of years, but at one point there were certain states that um, didn't allow you to 
offset that charge. So you can ask your donor, like, can you give $102 to offset the cost of the credit card? Um, so if you have the ability to do that, do that and use your online giving. You'll find a lot of people will pay that fee. Another suggestion I would have is, um, because I'm the accountant in the room, is give them a little bit of data. You know, show show your parish, show your donors what, you know, what your costs look like, you know, and if 80% of your cost is personnel and people get paid, you know, every two weeks or twice a month, um, just, you know, the equation doesn't balance. And so if you can provide a little bit of data, we spend this much on personnel, we spend this much on, on, you know, social action projects, you know, just give them a little bit of data. And that's when data can be really useful for, you know, getting the kind of um, activity, you know, getting the the kind of action you need out of people. I mean, this is something we we figured out at St. Columbus is the better the data got, the more people responded because they knew what they were responding to. And so I think that's important that you, you know, you, you, you know, you give enough data that they can do that. So uh, just real quick, I think we're, we want to make sure we allow a little bit of time for anything general at the end here, but this is just an example of, and this is only a 90 day cash um forecast but this is this is a um client this is these are real numbers it's a client that was having trouble making their payroll and so we said okay we're going to start with trying to do a 90-day forecast so you don't have to do a forecast for the entire year but just keep you know keep it a couple of months ahead so that you're not having a crisis every single month because it just chews up so much time everybody's time if every month is a cash crisis so we you know we helped them, you know, take their expenses over the last three months and then look forward, okay, what's going to happen in the next three months? And what's going to happen to your, you know, your, the, the, what's coming in? So, you know, recognize the lumpiness of pledge payments and, you know, own up to it. Don't say, well, we're going to get a 12th of our pledges in. Um, so this is just an example. It's not, there's not anything brilliant here, except just recognizing that some things don't come in like, like your reports might say they do. So, um, and this, this has a very ugly line at the bottom, additional unrestricted fundraising efforts needed for break even. Um, I hope you're not in this situation where you need, you need uh, money at the end of every month, but, um, you, you know, this happens and the idea is, like I said, not to, not to let it be a surprise. Just own up to it and, you know, do the work so you can really plan for it as much as you can. Um, yeah. Can I interject really quickly? Sure. Uh -huh. um, well, somebody said that their church builds an annual budget and should you do it for month, you know, break it out for monthly? Yes. Um, that's what Martha was talking about, the 12 months. So, for example, if you're in the D.C. area and there's snow, and you know you're going to have to spend five thousand dollars for snow revo removal. Don't put five thousand dollars in January or July, depending on what your first month of your fiscal year is. You want to spread that out over the months that it's going to snow, so you know that each month you should anticipate this much money for snow removal. So yes, you want to spread out. Also, like your pledge revenue, you don't want to put it all. On January 1, you're going to get all this money. You know that in January, you're going to get this much, this much, et cetera, each month with hardly any in June and July and August, and then some more and building up to December where you're going to put a lot of it. So yeah, you want to be able to break it out month by month so that it allows you to see what your spending is going to look like compared to what the money is that you normally get in during that time. It'll make It'll also make your budget versus actual reports a lot more meaningful if you can, you know, like I said earlier, a lot of times when you're explaining why you're over budget, it's a timing difference, but you'll have fewer and fewer of those timing differences to explain if your budget is actually spread out kind of the way the cost is incurred, as opposed right. to just dividing it by 12 and saying, okay, this is this month we're going to spend, you know, $1,000 on insurance when you know you're going to spend $12,000 on insurance in July. I mean, that's all a cash basis, but that's what we're talking about here is how to manage your cash. So. Um, someone said that when they send the quarterly pledge statements, the treasurer includes a letter. Yes, I definitely, um, say that's a very good practice and would encourage others to do that. 
Another asks, is an annual audit from an external auditor necessary or could less expensive review be satisfactory? I know some dioceses require audits, some don't. Um, some uh, parishes require audits, some don't. So I think that exactly what this person said, it puts depends on size of budget and I would agree with that. Um, you can do reviews sometimes. I, I've talked to some churches that have an internal review group that does it, or the diocese provides a review group that can do it that is of a far less cost than having a formal audit firm come in and do the review. So there's a lot of options out there, but you really want to go by whatever the bylaws are um, for your parish in particular. Um, if what, if, go ahead. Just let me say one more thing about that, Karen. If you're considering an audit and you're not required to have an audit, so you consider, I think we should do an audit for whatever reason, change, change in leadership, concerns, um, something like that. I would, the first place I would go is I would make an investment in the accounting because you can't go into an audit with messy accounting. The auditors will just turn you away at the door and say, come back when your books have been cleaned up. So uh, and we see that a lot on on first audits that, you know, they're the auditors say we can't do anything with this because they can't do your accounting for you because that that changes their objectivity and looking at your records. So if you really think you need an audit, you know, that's when I would bring in some people, whether it's volunteers from your congregation, professionals and say, look at our books. Do you think we could do an audit before you before you go out and get an audit firm and bring them in? And then they're then they yeah, anyway, go ahead, Kevin. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say, so we've gotten a lot of good questions. We only have five minutes left. So I don't know. Um, what do we have next on our slides? What was our... No, okay, so the next done. part, so this is good. So just keep going if you'll go towards... Um, uh, so just go all the way to the last slide, if you would, Martha. Um, so, well, the one that next one after that. Next there? one after that. Oh. There you go. Okay. So I know you all have a ton of questions. There's my email address. Just shoot them to me and I will, um, if I don't know the answer, I'll tap into Martha's knowledge and answer them for you. Um, we are an outsourced nonprofit accounting firm that can help you with your accounting. We can take on special projects if you have particular issues, you know, with your software, or if you're looking at a budgeting software and want to know how to integrate it within the software you have or how best to look at a whole software package, we can help you with that. We can help you with the budget process if you need help with just budgeting annually. Um, we do have consultative CFO type services. We have lower level accounting services and everything in between. So um, we're here to help you. I am a free resource <laughs> if you need to. Um, it, again, you've had a lot of really good questions. So if you want to send me any questions, feel free to jot down my email and I'll just respond to your answer. And um, if you have uh, time and you want to, you know, set up a consultation to see if it, if we can be of any assistance to you, we're happy to do that. Um, there's some last few questions. We've got a few minutes, so let's see. Um, one person asked, if you've got a ton of money, how much do you recommend you keep in the checking account? I used to be a banker. I would tell you to keep the um, FDIC, the amount that the FDIC coverage protects you for, and then move some over to an investment account that's also covered. Um, Let's see. Oh, who should be bonded in the church's financial oversight? How does the church decide if and when to outsource accounting services? So if we'll start with the first one. Who should be bonded? I don't, th I've never known anyone to be bonded. I don't know. Yeah, Martha, not, do you have an answer? I've not seen anybody bonded. Typically yeah. accountants are not bonded. Um, no. Um, you want to have a background check done on your staff. So that's always a good place to start. Mm -hmm. um, how does the church decide if and when to outsource accounting services? It just depends on your need and your level of expertise. If you feel that the people that are on staff or if you feel that you um, don't have either the capacity or the full knowledge of nonprofit accounting to ensure that your records are accurate, then you can, you know, I'm happy to have a conversation with you to talk to you about it. Uh, I was a client of Chazen and Companies when I was at um, St. Columbus Episcopal Church. They're still a client of Chazen's today. Martha was the accountant on our on our account. And um, I had, you know, the budgeting experience, the strategic thinking, trying to figure out how to make the church work, how to do things. But I would have to lean on Martha to say, like, can I use money from this fund to do this? Or so-and-so gave us money for this. Does this have to be isolated into the specific fund. So we can help you from a consultative basis like that. Um, 
Chazen also did the month end close for us and produced our financial reports and presented to the board. And I had someone in house who handled all the accounts payable and accounts receivable. And I did all the pledge and contribution posting into our software. So, you know, it can look and it can look a variety of ways. We can do all the accounting. We can do a piece of it. We can just be there for you to be like an insurance policy to help you out. Should you need something down the road? Any, you know, and everything in between. So, um, like I said, I'm happy to talk to y'all. Um, what items do you normally show for trends analysis? Do you have any thoughts on that, Martha? Well, I would, I mean, I, I would focus on the, the things that, you know, that are really critical to the operation. So it's not typically particularly useful to trend <laughs> payroll because payroll tends to be the same over time. So that's usually not a good thing to trend. You definitely want to trend, you know, cash payments on pledges. Um, uh, you, you, you know, your cash balance, like I showed that trend report. So things that, you know, critical things to the operation of the church financially are the things you want to think about the trends and 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 things that change. So, um, you know, like programming costs or something like that. There was some mention earlier about people going over budget and things like that. You know, has your program cost gone up? at a much greater rate than your um, giving percentage has gone up. Well, if that's the case, that, you know, that's a, not a sustainable model. So those are the kinds of things to be looking at. Um, you know, and then and then anything that it seems like you're spending too much money on, like, oh gosh, you know, telephone. I mean, anything that just, you know, and that's where you can bring in some, some strategic help from volunteers who are in their own businesses and things like that. And they're like, yeah, well, we saw postage costs go up. So we stop mailing these pieces or something like that. So I would say just focus in on things that are either just seem too high or things that are really drivers of both your revenue and your cost. And those would be the things that I would trend. So um, we are at time. We still have a lot of you on. So um, I can continue with some questions. I'd, like we said, this is being recorded. So if you jump off, that's fine. We understand. We'll hang on for about another five minutes and then we'll wrap it up. Um, there is a question, how would you handle pledges paid in full at the beginning of the year? I'm not fully sure about what you're asking, but I think as far as um, documenting them, I'll let Martha tell you from a gap standpoint how you book that, but just from a, a cash way, you just, you now know you have that money right at the beginning of the year and you just have to stretch it out through the year to get you to the end result. But go ahead, Martha, I don't know. Well, there's sort, of two, there's sort of two criteria that are important in how you would book them from a gap standpoint. One is, are they specific to a time period? So if it's, if it's a gift that says this is for 2024, then that is what we call a time restricted gift. It's restricted to 2024. But typically, and the other thing is, is when when did the commitment come in and how was it committed? If you have the effectively have a written commitment on a pledge and it's not specified what it's what time period it's for, then that is is revenue the day you get the commitment, not the day you get the cash. But that again, that's gap. Um, and that's not necessarily what you need for operations. So I think from an operating standpoint, is it's it becomes part of your cash management always better to have the cash early. You just have to manage it. So it's... there's a question about what percent of endowment should be used towards operating costs. Usually there's, um, you have bylaws that tell you that. Um, I don't know. Is there a law on that, Martha? I know no, there's a... no. Okay. There's, it's, it's, it's all governed by the agreement. So if okay. the agreement is silent to that question, then, then it's, you need to have a policy. You need to have an endowment policy. Okay. Um, how often should external auditors be changed? I think it's five years now. Also, go ahead. I'll let you talk about that. Marcel. Yeah, yeah. That's that's kind of five to seven years, um, just for objectivity reasons. And a lot of times they'll self-refer you to another firm if you just need to have a, a switch out in auditors. They do that among themselves, typically. Just a clarifying point, we are not an audit firm or um, a tax firm, not that you all file taxes, but if you have entities that are under you that do, um, we can refer you to audit firms, but we don't, we can help you prepare for them, but we don't actually perform them. 
Mm -hmm. um, when in the operating statement of revenue and expense, do you recommend recognizing pledges paid in advance the preceding year? So that was just what we were talking about. If, if the pledge is designated for the for the for a future year, it gets recognized in that future year because of the time. Well, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna stop myself just so I don't say something that's technically incorrect. But if 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 you are doing if you're audited or if you have a policy of doing gap financials, then you have to recognize the pledge at the time it was received. And then and then you have to recognize the fact that it's restricted on based on time. So it's it's a little complicated, but yes. I, this is an interesting question. I've always treated it as it as this, but relative to restricted gifts, do you believe that the gain from the gift is also restricted? It's typically not. It again, it depends, it depends on the agreement, but usually it's just it's just the what the amount that was given at the time it was given, that's restricted. And then the earnings aren't necessarily restricted. Again, you're always looking to the donor's intention on those restrictions. Um, one said all prepaids in January, the pledge year. Is that, I guess you were talking about prepaids. Um, that you book, you'd book all the prepaids in January of the pledge year. Now, if it's truly a prepaid, and let's not get into the technicalities, but if you prepay for something and you pay it in January, typically it'll be recognized as an asset and then it will be amortized or written off during the during the year. Um, so if I if I said that, I didn't I didn't mean to imply that, that it was that you have to recognize all your prepaids at the beginning of the year. You don't recognize a prepaid unless you pay something in advance that makes it prepaid. You don't. You don't recognize it because you know it's a commitment. That all that's all related to your cash forecasting side of things. So okay. Um, there was one, I can't find it. Oh. Anything else, Karen, in the last 30 seconds? <laughs> can't find the one. Oh, we're starting a capital campaign for a music center. Do we need chapter approval to transfer money from a general purpose music fund that is restricted anything for music to the capital campaign funds for the music center? So it's it's restricted music music dollars in a music fund that would be used. They're asking if they can transfer it to part of the capital campaign for the music center. I think you well, got to get donor approval. I don't know. About I you. Well, I would I would take a very careful read of the document. If you don't see the answer there and the person is, is still around and involved, I would just ask them to you know, specify their intent or if they're okay with that. Um, it, but it, it, again, if, if you have a vaguely written commitment from someone who's you know, no longer around, you, you can probably do it, but you would wanna make sure that you're, you know, that, someone in your sort of leadership structure is on board to do that with you. So, so someone asked a good question, and I think this is a good point. I, I have this conversation with churches when I'm talking to them if they're interested in outsourced accounting. They ask, are there things that I would recommend you keep in-house? When I get asked that question, I always say pledge and contributions. So if you do have someone that can record all the contributions into your donor database, I always recommend that that person be in-house. If, if you know, we can do it, but here's the thing. If you have Mrs. Smith who gave a thousand dollars in her Sunday offering in the plate and she doesn't always do it and she's a little nervous and on Tuesday morning she walks past past your door to go visit the rector and she sticks her head in and says, did you get my thousand dollars from Sunday? I think it's awesome for the person that's sitting there to be able to say, yes, I did. Thank you so much for your contribution, Mrs. Smith. I got it. Because yes, if you if you're on a database where they can log in and they can pull up their contributions, that's great. She can do that herself. But a lot of them don't, and it just it comes to their mind. And I just think it's good for you to be able to have that interface. I also always took the attitude of those those are the individuals paying my salary. So I try to um, you know honor them as much as possible and be able to have that face recognition as the person that's handling their money. I think is huge. 
again, we can do it for you. We do it for other clients. But if you were to ask me, what would I tell you to keep in house? That would be one of them. So. I mean, we could help you put up a, a control structure around the cash so that there's no question about who's doing it, what authority right. do they have and all of that. But, but yeah, any, and, and churches more than really many other organizations handle a lot of cash and checks and that's cumbersome to deal with, you know, with somebody who's outsourced and not, not on site. So. Okay. All right. Well, I think that wraps up our um, webinar for today. Thank you all for sticking around. We still have a lot of you still on it. So thank you for staying till the bitter end and staying over. So we thank you for your commitment. Um, we thank you for this partnership and uh, EPN has been great. So um, if again, if you have any questions, you have my email, please feel free to reach out. We will be sending the, or EPN will be sending you our PowerPoint presentation along with a link to the recording. So thank you all and have a great rest of your week.